Um, other questions? General quantum field theory evaluating this object. Uh, it's always good to have specific examples in mind, and I will have th I will uh, discuss. I will write down three examples, which we will discuss alternately throughout these uh, this portion of the lectures. Number one is a free scalar field. interacting with some space-time dependent C number function of X, which I call rho and which is controllable. I will assume, to make everything simple, that rho goes to zero as X goes to infinity in either a space-like or time-like direction. This model, to give you some idea of why I wrote something down like this, obeys the equations of motion. G is a free parameter called the coupling constant. I could, of course, absorb G in rho, but later on I would like to study what happens as I increase G while keeping rho fixed. Equals minus G rho of s. But this equation is very parallel to the fundamental equation of electrodynamics in a Coulomb gauge, in a Lorentz gauge del squared a mu equals minus e j mu, where j mu is the electromagnetic current. <coughs> in the real world, of course, in electromagnetism, j mu is some complicated function. In fact, we've shown how to construct it of uh, fields of uh, charged particles. However, it's frequently convenient to consider a simpler problem in which j mu is just some C number, something under experimental control. We are making moving about large charged bodies on tracks in some classical way, changing the current. And this makes, quant makes light, which is quantum photons. So here we have the analogous problem to a the electromagnetic field, which we don't yet know how to quantize in an external current, subject to an external current distribution for a meson field. Okay. We would expect, since we know Intuitively, we know from our previous knowledge that in this problem, this current makes light. We also know that light is photons. This current makes photons. We would expect here, when we wiggle this source, rho of x, turn it on and turn it off and shake it around, we should shake off mesons. And we will try and compute exactly how many mesons are shaken off and in what states. This will be our simplest model because there is no need here to invoke an adiabatic turning on and off function. The, uh, the real honest-to-goodness physics of the problem with rho of x automatically turns itself on and off by assumption. Our second model, which will be analytically somewhat simpler, but uh, uh, physically requires a bit more thought, is exactly the same thing except we restrict rho to be a function of x only, independent of time. And of course, again, I'll assume rho goes to 0 as rapidly as necessary to make any of our integrals converge as x goes to infinity. No, x goes to infinity along any fixed direction. space, time, or, you know, x, y, z, cosine theta, anything. <laughs> I could write magnitude of x, but then I, I couldn't write magnitude of x here. Well, I could, but it would be the Euclidean magnitude, not the, not the uh, Lorentz magnitude. Uh, the, uh, this problem is uh, the analogous a analog of uh, good old electrostatics where I have a static charge distribution or a static current distribution, and I wish to compute the electromagnetic field it makes. Here I have a static source. 
<coughs> I don't know what's going to happen here. Well, I do, in fact. We don't know at this stage. Maybe mesons will scatter off the static source, and it will act like a potential in which they move. We'll see. Uh, this problem, as I say, is physically uh, uh, slightly more, requires slightly more sophisticated thought, as we will see, because here we will indeed have to put in a turning on and off function, because the physics doesn't turn itself off. The third problem involves two fields. One neutral and one charged. Therefore, as the coupling goes to zero, we have three particles, a particle and its antiparticle from here, and a single neutral particle from here. And here we have a coupling. Aside from the fact that nothing has spins, and I haven't put in any derivatives or tensor indices, this is very similar in its, in its uh, algebraic structure to what we would expect for real electrodynamics, where the electromagnetic field, mimicked here by the phi field, is coupled to a quadratic function in the fields of the charged particles. Uh, th this uh, theory is, so to speak, if this is quantum mesostatics, this is quantum mesodynamics. <laughs> uh, the, uh, Actually, it's also very similar in its combinatoric structure to uh, in the powers of fields that enter the Lagrangian, not in the, but not in the appearance of the spin indices, to uh, the uh, actual theory of mesons and nucleons that play such an important role in the theory of nuclear forces. And therefore, I will sometimes refer to the psi particles as nucleons and antinucleons, respectively, and the phi the quanta created by the phi as mesons. They are, of course, scalar nucleons and scalar mesons. <clears throat> the, um, in all uh, three cases, we will, do the, we will tr attempt to analyze the problem by interaction picture perturbation theory. Uh, HI, for example, is plus g, the interaction density, the thing you have to integrate to get the actual interaction Hamiltonian, rho of x, phi of x, where, since I'm always going to be working in the interaction picture, phi equals phi i, I won't bother putting the i's on the phi's, in case 1. In case 2, it's equal to g, rho of x, phi of x, and t, times f of t, because our rule is we artificially insert an adiabatic turning on and off function, which will let, later let go to zero. And finally, in case three, it's g psi star psi phi f of t. <coughs> we will attempt to evaluate the U matrix in all these cases by Dyson's formula, ui of infinity minus infinity equals time-ordered product exponential minus i integral d4x script hi. That's equivalent to integral dt capital hi. So these are the three models we are going to play with. I should tell you in advance that it will turn out that for models one and two, we will be able to sum up perturbation theory and solve the models exactly. That should not surprise you because the Heisenberg equations of motion are linear. So, and anything that involves linear equations of motion is an exactly soluble system. In case three, we won't be able to. It's more realistic in that sense, and therefore we will have to talk about effects occurring order by order in perturbation theory. Now, these are the specific models. Are there any questions about them? I hope you have some vague ideas about why I think they're interesting models to look at. Yes, sir. One half x squared. 
Uh, no. There's a slip of the chalk. Thank you. For the complex field, the one half is put in automatically by the square root of two that expresses the complex field in terms of real fields. Slip of the chalk. No. Our general trick will be an algorithm for turning time-ordered products into normal-ordered products. Time-ordered products are not defined for any string of field operators. They're only defined for strings of field operators that have time labels on them. Normal ordered products are not defined for any string of operators. They're only defined for strings of free fields. Fortunately, in Dyson's formula, we have both things with time indices on them and which are free fields. So it makes sense to talk about writing of things alternatively in terms of time ordered products and normal ordered products. The reason this is a useful thing to do is that it's very easy to compute the matrix elements of normal ordered products once you have them. For example, if I have a two-particle state, oh, I'll relativistically normalize it. And if in between I have the normal ordered product of a string of field operators, this thing obviously equals 0 if n is greater than 4. The reason being that each term either has too many annihilation operators, three or more, where upon acting on the state on the right, if two of them get you to the vacuum at best, and the third one annihilates the state, or it has too many creation operators, three or more, where upon acting on the state on the left, the same arguments apply. So it's very easy if we're, say, interested in two-particle and the two-particle scattering, and if we have an expansion of things in terms of normal-ordered products, all the normal-ordered products that involve more than four field operators are of no interest to us. Also, when we have it in the form, as we will see, that involves only four field operators, it's very easy what to do. It's very easy to read off the matrix element. Well, of course, two field operators could also do it if two of the momenta were equal in the initial and final state. And none could do it if all of the momentum were equal. One has a non-zero matrix element between these states. Uh, it's very easy to read off what happens, because all that can happen in this case is that the two of the field operators you must take their annihilation part, and they annihilate the two initial particles, bring you down to the vacuum. And then two others of the field particles spit out the two final particles, bring you back to the final two-particle state. <laughs> So as we will see, it is very simple to compute the matrix elements of normal ordered products. So if we have an algorithm for turning time ordered products into normal ordered products, for taking a time ordered product of a string of field operators and turning it into a normal ordered product, we have done gone a long way into making the successive terms of this perturbation expansion very simple to compute and minimizing the amount of operator algebra we have to play with. I will now explain such an algorithm, but to explain it, I will have to give uh, some definitions. Let A of X and B of Y be free fields. Of course, we're always dealing with free fields since we're always in the interaction picture. I will define an object called the contraction by saying that the time-ordered product of a of x, b of y, equals the normal ordered product of a of x, b of y, plus the contraction a of x, b of y. I will show that for free fields, uh, the contraction is a C number, and then I will evaluate it for the cases we need. That is to say, for two phi's, phi and a psi, phi and a psi bar, psi bar and a psi, etc. <coughs> to prove it as a C number, I'll um, respond for the moment to the case when x naught is greater than y naught. The corresponding formula when x naught is less than y naught will follow by the same reasoning. In this case, the right hand side is a of x, b of y, 
because x naught is greater than y naught. And I break this up into plus and minus terms. where plus is the creation part and minus is the annihilation part. I shouldn't put commutator there. I should just put product. Now, oh, there are four terms in this product, and three of them are already normal ordered. Plus plus is normal ordered, minus minus is normal ordered, minus plus, oh, sorry, plus minus is normal ordered. The only one that is not normal ordered is minus plus. Therefore, this is normal ordered product, a of x, b of y, plus the commutator of a minus of x, b plus of y, which we all know is a C number. It's zero if A and B are different fields and some non-zero function, delta plus, if A and B are the same field. OK, now that we know that this object is a C number, we can, uh, obviously, a similar argument goes for y naught less than x naught. Now that we know that this object is a C number, we can write another expression for the contraction simply by taking the ground state expectation value of the equation above. And that tells us A of x, B of y is the vacuum expectation value of the time ordered product of A of x, B of y vacuum since the normal ordered product always has zero vacuum expectation value. By an amazing coincidence, this is something which you computed in our first homework problem set. So I could save myself 15 minutes and just remind you that phi of x phi of y equals integral d4k over 2 pi to the fourth e to the i k dot x minus y, i over k squared minus mu squared plus i epsilon, where epsilon is something that is going to go to 0 through positive values. But I'll just write it that way and leave it unwritten that epsilon is to go to 0 through positive values. Ah, I'll put it on the side here for the last time. Whenever I write an epsilon in the future, epsilon goes to 0 plus. Although you didn't do it for f psi, it's essentially the same calculation. And it's very easy to see that psi star of x, psi of x, psi star of y equals integral of the same thing, i over k squared minus m squared plus i epsilon. You get two equal terms from the phi 1 and phi 2, but that 2 is canceled by the square root of 2 in the definition. Yes, sir? On your decomposition into uh, creation and annihilation part, is that only possible? For this is only for free fields. No, it is not. There is no, it is certainly not possible for an interacting field. This would be nonsense. If someone begins to talk about the normal ordered product of Heisenberg fields, you have to ask him what he means by it. It's, we have certainly not defined it. The time ordered product, of course, we could talk about for Heisenberg fields. Fortunately, we are working in the interaction picture, and all we have to deal with are free fields. States are complicated but in their time development, but fields are free. All other contractions obviously vanish. Phi with phi, phi with phi star with phi star, psi with psi, psi star with psi star, and psi with phi. <clears throat> Any questions about this? Now, we'll have to introduce two notational con uh, conventions. 
to explain my result. If I have an expression like this, with a bunch of free fields, for example, and if I draw a symbol like this, where b is contracted with d, this simply means normal ordered product a of x, c of z, contraction b of y, d of w. Okay. If I have a string of things and I make a contraction symbol that joins two things inside the normal ordered product, by convention, that just means you evaluate that contraction, which is a C number, and take it outside. <clears throat> Third, my second notational convention, which I will adopt for simplicity, is that I want to consider a general string of field operators in a general theory. And therefore, I will have to deal with objects which, in general, I would write phi a1 of x1, phi a2 of x2, etc. I will go bananas if I have to keep on writing all those x's and in indices. So I will just write this object as time ordered product phi1, phi n where little one down there means x is x1 and a is a1, whatever a1 may happen to be as we run over our catalog of fields. <clears throat> I am now in a position to state the algorithm for get getting a string, of, a time-ordered string of field operators in terms of normal ordered products. It is called Wick's theorem. And it's the first of a sequence of combinatoric calisthenics we will go through on this fine Thursday afternoon. Now, Wick's theorem goes as follows. I can't even, nobody can write it out, in fact, unless you invent a super compressed notation, so I'll have to use words. Time ordered product of a string of field operators, phi 1 to phi n, is a sum of terms, the first of which is the normal ordered product of phi 1 to phi n. The second set of terms, actually a family of n times n minus 1 over 2 terms, goes like, is all terms with one contraction. That is to say, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi n, plus phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, dot, 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 phi n, plus all other contractions with phi 1 contracted with something else, and then plus phi 1 contracted with phi 2, phi 3, dot, 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 phi n, etc n times n minus 1 over 2 terms, all the terms with one contraction, plus all the terms with two contractions. For example, to write down one that looks a little more peculiar, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, phi 1 contracted with phi 2 and phi, phi 1 with 3, 1 with 3 and 2 with 4, dot, 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 plus, et cetera, all the way down. In other words, you draw all possible contractions in all possible ways. No contractions, one contraction, two contractions, up to n over 2 contractions. And the fact that all of these terms occur in the incredible process of commutation required to turn a time-ordered product into a normal-ordered product is not surprising. What is surprising and what is the content of the theorem is that each of them occurs with coefficient plus one. Okay. Is the theorem clear? 
I can't possibly write it out. I mean, <laughs> yes. It doesn't matter. Yeah, you'll see. There's no. There's no problem. Yeah, because uh, phi and this commutes with itself at equal time. So which order you write things in is irrelevant. Um, if we had to do with theories with derivative interactions, we would have a problem because then we would have pi's as well as phi's in our interaction Hamiltonian, and they would not commute at equal times. That is a problem we will deal with much later. Okay. At the moment, we have non-derivative interactions, and uh, therefore there is no problem. I'm now, it turns out in the proof of the theorem, I'm going to have to use this formula down here at the bottom of the board, x naught greater than y naught. Is the theorem clear? For example, if I had four fields, I would have one term with no contraction. Six terms with one contraction, 4 times 3 over 2. Six terms with two contractions, because once I've told what the first contracted pair is, the second contracted pair is determined, period. So I would write the time-ordered product of four fields as a sum of 13 terms. However, this is not so disgusting as you might think, because if we're only interested in evaluating particular matrix elements by the observation I made earlier, and if we have our interest in evaluating the matrix element between, say, two two-particle states, which have different momenta, mo no momentum in the initial state is the same as any momentum in the final state, only the first of these 13 terms can contribute. <laughs> the others don't have enough annihilation and creation operators in them to uh, to destroy all of the initial particles and replace them with all of the final particles. Yes, sir? Uh, when you counted the, the number of two contractions before, don't, don't you count some of them twice then? No, no. I, uh, oh, you're right. Yes, only three terms. I said 13. I should have said 10. That's right, because I don't, it doesn't matter which pair I contract first and which pair I contract second. Thank you. Yes. I said 13. I should have said 10. That's right. One can either be contracted with two, three, or four, and then what the remaining contraction is is determined. Now, the proof will be by iteration. The theorem is obviously true. It's true for n equals 1, because for n equals 1, there are no contractions that you can make, and the time-ordered product is identical to the normal-ordered product. Both are phi. It's true for n equals 2, because that's the definition of the contraction. <laughs> I will assume the theorem is true induction. Assume true for n minus 2 and n minus 1, and I will prove true for n. Okay. That's how we'll go about proving the theorem. Now, first step. With absolutely no loss of generality, I can assume x1 is greater than x, x1 naught is greater than or equal to x2 naught is greater than or equal to x3 naught, etc. The reason is that both the right and the left hand side of Wick's theorem are completely invariant under permutations of the field operators, and therefore I might as well permute them <laughs> and prove it only for this particular order. <laughs> So neither the normal ordered product nor the time ordered product depends on the order in which we write things down on the blackboard. <clears throat> Therefore, time ordered product, first we'll work on the left hand side, phi 1 to phi n, 
equals phi 1, phi 2, dot, 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 phi n equals, I didn't do a good job of erasing, did I? Phi 1 plus, plus phi 1 minus phi 2, dot, 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 phi n. That's the right-hand side, the left-hand side of Wick's theorem. The right-hand side, I can't even write, I'm not going to write down for you again. It nearly killed me writing it down once. So I'll just refer to it as the right-hand side. And I will divide all the terms in it into two terms. Terms where phi 1 is contracted, is not contracted, actually, I'll do first. Plus terms where phi 1 is contracted. That's certainly an exclusive classification of the terms. <laughs> okay. Now, what is the first term? We're terms where phi 1 is not contracted. Well, phi 1 is inside a normal ordering symbol, which means that its creation part is on the left and its violation part is on the right. That's what normal ordering means. Once its creation part is on the left, it doesn't matter if it's on the far left or it's got two other creation operators to the left of it. All creation operators commute. So I'll bring the creation part of phi 1 off on the left. And then that'll be time something. Okay. What is that something? Then there'll also be exactly the same something with the annihilation part over on the right. What is that something? Well, that something is simply a sum of all possible contractions involving all the fields other than phi 1. By an inductive step, since we assume Wick's theorem is true for n less than little v n in question for n minus 1, that is simply phi 2 phi n, since they're already time ordered. Okay, that's the inductive step. Once I pull out the phi 1, the things that is left is the string phi 2 the phi n with all possible consumed over all possible contractions. And by the assumption that Wick's theorem is true for n minus 1, that is phi 2 the phi n. Ha, looking good, huh? <laughs> phi 1 minus, thank you. Okay. Now we come to the second parentheses. Terms where phi 1 is not contracted. I is contracted. Well, that's everything else with a phi 1 contraction. And that's obvious by the identity here and the fact that x naught 1 is the latest possible time. Simply the commutator of phi 1 minus with phi 2 phi n. Because if I compute this commutator, I'll get a term of n minus 1 terms each of which will involve the commutator of phi 1 with phi 2. I wrote here plus, but of course, two minus parts always commute. I could have erased the plus here. <laughs> it would be the commutator of phi 1 with phi 2 times phi 3 to phi n, the commutator of phi 1 with phi 3 times phi 2, phi 4, dot, 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 phi n, et cetera. That's the phi 1 with phi 2 contraction. For the rest, we use Wick's theorem for n minus 2 <laughs> and get the other term on the left hand side, on the right hand side. Now, it is a work of a moment to see, therefore, that the right hand side and the left hand side are equal. And therefore, with a lot of talking, which I hope you will forgive me because otherwise I would have covered the board with complicated equations, we have proved the theorem. <laughs> Now, some of you may have fallen asleep for a moment while I was talking, so if you wish me to repeat any stage of that argument, please ask. Yes? 
okay, we have this formula for the contraction, and I could erase the plus here because two minus is always compute. Okay. <coughs> Let me look a little more closely at this object. By using the rule for commuting with a chain, okay, and remembering the commutator phi 1 minus with phi 2 as a C number and equal to the contraction, I get phi 1, phi 2 times phi 3, phi 4, dot, 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 phi n plus phi 1, phi 3, phi 2, phi 4, dot, 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 phi n, plus, etc. Okay? Now here I have a string of n minus 2 field operators. Therefore, I evaluate that according to Wick's theorem, drawing all possible contractions. Those are just what gives me all the terms where phi 1 is contracted with something. Here is where well, the term where it is something is phi 2. Here is the term where it is something is phi 3, etc. OK? You will find the proof of this theorem in 100 different ways if you find 100 different books on quantum field theory. Well, there are probably no more than 40, so you can probably find no more than 40 different proofs. But if you don't get it here, you can go to the library and browse around until you find a book where it is proved to your satisfaction. It's a standard, standard combinatoric theorem. Now, Wick's theorem is very nice, but we are going to do things that are even better because we are going to find a diagrammatic rule for representing every term in the Wick expansion. I will explain this di what this diagrammatic rule looks like, so instead of having to write complicated contractions, we can just write simple looking diagrams. I will um, explain this diagrammatic rule for the theory with the most complicated interaction Hamiltonian of the three we are considering. Our third example, in which I remind you that HI equals G F of T psi bar psi phi. I'll keep my compressed notation to keep myself from getting uh, sick, so I'll write phi 1 is simply phi of x1, etc. Now, a general term in Dyson's formula, you remember the thing we have to study is the time-ordered exponential integral d4x minus i g h i. A typical term in Dyson's formula arising in nth order of perturbation theory will involve n of these factors evaluated at points psi x1, x2, xn. I will draw a diagram on the board. Whenever I have a factor coming out, I will put a dot here. I will label this dot with a number 1 or 2, x1, x2, etc. And then I will associate it with this dot, an arrow going in and an arrow going out, and a line without an arrow on it at all. And the interpretation of these things is that an arrow going in is a psi. And an arrow going out is a psi star at point 1, psi star at point 1, and phi at 1. Likewise here, phi 2, psi 2, and psi star 2. Okay, in this way I can associate with a pattern of dots with three lines coming out from each dot. It seems trivial so far the ter various terms that occur in the, inter in the expansion. The number of dots that appear on the blackboard are the order and perturbation theory to which you are going. Now, whenever two terms are contracted, I will join the lines. Notice that that's legitimate. I can either join a straight line with a straight line because there's a non-zero phi phi contraction, or I can join the head of an arrow with the tail of an arrow because there's a non-zero psi psi star contraction. Thus, for example, a diagram corresponding to a term
that arises in second order of perturbation theory is this, where I've chosen to contract a psi with a psi star. Reading this diagram and we look, staring at this diagram and remembering what the uh, theory is and the rule which I have explained here, we see, we write down what is going on. This is a second order perturbation diagram because there are two vertices. Therefore, we get the associated operator minus IG squared, because there's always an IG, two factorial from the expansion of the exponential. Now we have d4x1, d4x2, because we've got two d4x's, normal ordered product, psi star 1, psi 1, phi 1, psi star 2, psi 2, phi 2. And the arrow going out of 2 is contracted with the arrow going in at 1. An arrow going in is a psi, and an arrow going out is a psi star. So I must connect psi 1 with psi star 2. An arrow going in is a psi 1. An arrow going out is a psi star. I have drawn this diagram so the arrow coming in at 1 is contracted with the arrow going out at 2 and is joined, I should say, joining the arrows means contract the operators and therefore I have joined, so, contracted psi 1 with psi star 2. Okay. Notice only the topological character of these diagrams is important. If I could have write them, you know, twisted upside down or bent around upon themselves, that doesn't matter. It represents the same term. Simply that, I represent the three field operators associated with each integration point by one of these objects. And when I make contractions, I contract the field operators. I contract, I join the lines. So I have a one-to-one -one correspondence between these diagrams and the terms in Wick's theorem. As a second example, by the way, here we have an operator that has an uncontracted psi 1 star, an, uncontra two, an uncontracted psi star, an uncontracted psi, and two phi's. Thus, this particular operator, which is one of several terms that comes in to uh, Wick's theorem, uh, could contribute, for example, to the process nucleon plus meson. Remember, nucleons are what our psi field annihilates goes into nucleon plus meson because it, can, it contains a nucleon annihilation operator, a meson annihilation operator, a nucleon creation operator, and a meson creation operator. It could also make a contribution to the matrix element for the process antinucleon plus meson. It goes into antinucleon plus meson because every term that contains a nucleon creation operator also contains an antinucleon annihilation operator. Or, for example, it could contribute to the process phi plus phi goes into n plus n bar, picking annihilation and creation operators in the right way. Or the process n plus n bar goes into phi plus phi, picking annihilation operator, etc. Well, there is no more etc. allowed by energy momentum conservation. People are looking blank. Don't look blank. Ask questions. If you are only allowed to be silent, if you are smart, stupid people are required to talk. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm sorry. Momentarily confused people. Momentarily confused people are allowed to talk. Every possible diagram. All the diagrams are set of 17th order. All the terms in Wick's theorem of 17th order consist of all things with 17 dots, with all lines connecting them drawn in all possible ways, ranging from no lines connecting them, which is simply the normal ordered product of 51 fields, the first terms in Wick's theorem, to one line joining them, which is the term with one contraction, to two lines joining them, which are the terms with two contractions, etc. Uh, both of which will turn out to vanish by energy momentum conservation. There's, which is a, this is a Wick's product of three field operators. 
there is this one, which is nothing contracted and vanishes, unless we've stupidly chosen things so our meson mass is so large it can decay into nucleon, antinucleon. <laughs> and this one, which vanishes, again, by energy momentum conservation, because you can't build a one meson state that has the same energy and momentum as the vacuum state. OK? Yes? On our diagram, every vertex that's right. These are not yet Feynman diagrams. These are objects I have introduced myself to make the pa eventual passage to Feynman diagrams, which we'll get to next lecture, as painless as possible. I will call these objects Wick diagrams. They differ from the Feynman diagrams we will talk about later because they have numbers on them and because they represent operators, and Feynman diagrams represent matrix elements. Okay. Most texts go, try and go directly to the Feynman diagrams, and I find the combinatorics gets too complicated that way. I want to go in relatively easy stages by beginning with the Wick diagrams, which are th my ad hoc notation, not a term you will find in them. Hmm? Can you get Feynman diagrams by We'll get them next lecture, you'll explain, between specific states. Yeah. Feynman, and then we uh, will do other things to get rid of the numbers down here. So Feynman diagrams will not have any numbers on the vertices, but they'll have momenta attached to the lines, external lines. Yes, sir? What do, you, what do the numbers on the vertices mean? They mean integrate d4x1, d4x2. OK, this diagram with 2 and 1 interchange is not the same term in Wick's theorem, because with 2 and 1 interchange, we would connect the psi star at 2 with the psi at 1. Both of those terms are present. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for example, I was going to write that down. I'll give you a second example. It also occurs in second order in perturbation theory. done. Incoming arrow and outgoing arrow. This is minus ig squared over 2 factorial integral d4x1 integral d4x2 psi star 1, psi 1, phi 1, psi star 2, psi 2, phi 2. Whoops, I left something out. I left out the f here, which of course was there f of t1, f of t2. That was there in our interaction, Hamiltonian, and I forgot to copy it down. f of t1, f of t2. And here I have contracted the phi at 1 with the phi at 2. Okay. I can join an undirected line to an undirected line because there is a non-zero phi phi contraction. I can join the head of an arrow to a tail of the arrow because there is a non-zero psi psi star contraction. It would be ludicrous to draw a diagram which I connected the head of an arrow to the head of an arrow because that would be a psi psi star psi star psi star contraction which vanishes. Okay. What? On normal order. Thank you. Okay. The rule is very simple because it's just a transcription into geometric terms of the combinatoric rule of Wick's theorem plus Dyson's formula. For every term of hi, we have two psi, a psi, a psi star, and a phi. All possible contractions simply means all possible connections. Yes, sir? That's correct. Yes, and we will discover what they mean in the course of time. They certainly occur in Wick's theorem. Those are the terms where everything is contracted. For example, <coughs> here's another second order diagram. And that corresponds to a real term in Wick's theorem. The same thing as above times psi star 1, psi 1, phi 1, psi star 2, psi 2, phi 2. The phi at 1 is contracted to the phi at 2. 
the psi at 1 is connected to the psi star at 2, and the psi star at 1 is connected to the psi at 2. That's what the rule says, and Wick's theorem says that comes out. We'll discover the physical meaning of those diagrams next lecture. But they're there. Okay, they're there because Wick's theorem tells you they're there. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Every way you can connect lines corresponds to doing some contractions. Yes, sir. No, I'm sorry. That was a slip of the chalk. The G is in here. That would put G squared. Thank you. Other questions? Now, I will now, having caused you to get a headache over Wick's theorem and get a headache over the diagrammatic representation of Wick's theorem, give you an even more of a headache by manipulating these diagrams in certain ways. Now, it's obvious that if we attempted to individually compute any one of these diagrams, we would be, uh, all of these diagrams and sum them up, there's some trivial overcounting we will do. We would have to do the same computation several times. For example, in this case, as I emphasized, the diagram with two and one interchanged is not the same as the diagram with one and two interchanged. It represents a different term in the integrand. However, the integral is identical because we end up integrating over x1 and x2. And that will give us uh, exactly the same answer once we're done integrating. Remember, we apply Wick's theorem before we integrate, and then we integrate. So here, this diagram is not the same as the diagram with 2 and 1 interchange. So we have two terms in the Wick expansion of the integrand that give us identical integrals when we're done, because x1 and x2 are just integrals. Indeed, any diagram will have a, um, a, uh, any other diagram we obtain from it by merely permuting the indices will give us the same result in the integrand because all the indices on the vertices tell us is what we call x1 and what we call x2 and we're integrating over all of them in the end. Therefore, I will introduce a little more combinatoric notation. Guess I'll have to use the center board. Let D be a diagram with N of D vertices. Some, you count it. I give you a diagram, some drawing. I count the number of vertices, OK? And, um, and I will uh, say two diagrams. Uh, how should I phrase this? I just wrote patterns on my notes. Uh, D1 and D2 are of the same pattern. if they differ just by a permutation of the indices. N of D1, which of course equal N of D2, otherwise they won't differ by a permutation. <laughs> Okay, therefore, this diagram here and the one with two and one interchanged are of the same pattern. Now, uh, with a given diagram of a given pattern, we, we associate an operator 
which I will write as a normal ordered product of some operator associated with D divided by n of d factorial. That's the n factorial that comes from the exponential. And it's all I extract it out and define the rest to be O of d. All those phi 1s, phi 2s, phi 3s, integrals, contractions, OK? That's just how I'm going to define O of d. And then there'll be an n, the n of d factorial I'm going to pay special attention to. Factorials are always important in combinatoric discussions. So I extract it out in front. Right, precisely. Now, by a curious coincidence, there are n of d factorial ways of rearranging the indices. <laughs> okay. This, however, does not mean that there are n of d factorial different diagrams of the same pattern. It would be lovely if it were so, but it is not so. In this case, there are. Because I exchange two and one, I get something different. In this case here, there ain't. Because if I exchange two and one, I get exactly the same instruction. Contract the meson at one with the meson at two, which is the same as the instruction. Contract the meson at two with the meson at one. <laughs> okay. Therefore, I have to introduce a concept. S of D equals, which we'll call the symmetry number. Sorry it gets so complicated, but this is just a way station. It'll simplify in a, in a, in a half an hour, but I want to get all the steps straight. Symmetry number equals number of permutations of indices that don't change the term that don't change anything. Thus, for example, in this case, exchanging the indices 1 and 2 doesn't change a thing. In the other case, it does. To give you a more complicated example, I'll write down a more complicated example. Uh, what will it be? Oh, here's a good one. Sorry. There's a diagram that contributes, among other things, to nucleon nucleon scattering. And I will complicate it a bit. There. That's a nice complicated diagram <laughs> that arises <coughs> in um, sixth order of perturbation theory. Now, <coughs> Once I have, this diagram happens to have s equals 2, as I will argue. There are only two permutations that don't of the indices that don't change anything. And those are the permutations that co correspond to switching all of the bottom indices with all of the top indices. You see, vertex 1 plays exactly the same role as vertex 2. Contract meson at 1 with meson on 2. 5 and 6 play exactly the same role as 4 and 3. However, once I have made, uh, taken account of this, saying, say, by uniquely declaring this is the top vertex, then all the others are completely determined. This is the unique vertex connected by a meson line to this vertex. This is the unique vertex connected by a nucleon line to this to the one I've identified before. This is the unique one connected by a meson line to this one. This is the unique one connected by going on along a nucleon line backwards to this one. And this is the line remaining vertex. So once I've decided which of 4 and 5 is 4 and 5, then I have everything labeled uniquely. And different all other permutations of the indices will reproduce different terms in the Wick expansion. So this is, again, a diagram with s equals 2, symmetry number 2. And you can play around if you enjoy these sorts of combinatoric games trying to invent diagrams with s equals 6 or <laughs> so on, so four, you know, all sorts of things. Now, remember, the, therefore, with each pattern, we get how many distinct terms? Uh, 
R, N of D factorial over S of D terms. Because if we permute the indices in all possible ways, we get N of D factorial different things, but we're overcounting by S of D. Now, therefore, summing over a whole pattern, everything of the same pattern as a given diagram, yields N of D factorial, O of D, normal ordered, S of D, 1 over N of D factorial. Therefore, the N of D factorial gets knocked down into simply S of D. Well, this is a bit complicated, but we've saved ourselves labor. If we were really going to compute this diagram, there are six factorial different permutations. And it would be rather stupid. I don't even know what six factorial is, 100, 720. There are 720 different permutations. And it would really be rather stupid to, to compute all 720 I wrote down a connected Wick diagram. All the diagrams I've written down up till now are connected. But I could imagine a disconnected diagram. Here is one that arises in fourth order. It's a perfectly reasonable Wick diagram. Anything I can draw on the board, as long as I don't connect the head of an arrow with the tail of an arrow or put four vertices, four lines into a single vertex is an allowable term in Wick's theorem. But it is completely, dis it falls into two identical disconnected components. Here is a more complicated disconnected diagram with three disconnected components. <laughs> now we're going to come to a marvelous theorem. I have to define things. Let me make a list Let me count, label in some way. Let dr, r equals 1, 2, 3, infinity, be a complete set i.e. one of each pattern of connected diagrams. That is to say, the four diagrams we've written on the board, this one uh, connected diagrams, the one I have here, the six-point diagram, is not connected. A general diagram will have some integer and our components of the pattern of dr, where the uh, n's could be any numbers, any uh, non-positive or negative integer, uh, sorry, not negative, any positive or zero integer. For example, this is a diagram in which two of the nr's are non-zero. One of them, the one corresponding to this connected diagram is equal to 2, and the one corresponding to this connected diagram is equal to 1. Now, this is, will be the last of our combinatoric exercises. I'm going to try and write what the general connected diagram is, gives us, in terms of what the operator associated with all the diagrams of this pattern is in terms of what we get for the individual connected parts. Because after all, it's pretty easy. The operator in here, we've got an integral d4x1, d4x2, and we've only got functions of x1 minus x1 and x2 an integral of 3, 4 with only a function of 3 and 4, 
the contraction here. So it's factors. Okay? The operator is just a factor. Thus, it yields an operator, which is what? Aside from the combinatoric factor, it's o product on R to infinity, O of dr to the nr, the whole thing normal order. Here we get some operator from doing the x1, x2 integral, some operator from doing the x3, x4 integral, some operator from doing the x5, x6 integral. So we get a single operator squared and, a, uh, and another operator once. Now, what about the combinatoric factor? That's the characteristic of disconnected diagrams. The operators associated with them are simply the normal ordered products of the operators associated with the individual connected components. What about the combinatoric factors? How many permutations can I make that will not change the diagram? Well, firstly, I could permute the indices. I'm summing over a whole pattern now, sorry. Whole pattern such things. Firstly, for each, within each component, I can certainly permute the indices just as if that component were there all by itself. Therefore, I get product on R, 1 over S of dr to the nr. I can do it in the first component, I can do it in the second, I can do it in the third. But now I can do one thing more. If I have two identical components, I can bodily exchange the indices in the first component and those in the second, which one and two as a block for three and four. And if I have, so I can do, there's an extra permutation. And if I have three identical components, I can do three factorial extra permutations. And therefore, I have product on R, one over NR factorial indicating that if I have identical components, I can switch indices among them blockwise without changing the diagram, without changing the term in the wiki expansion. Just changes, all it does is exchange this thing here with this thing here. That's the same wiki diagram. Is everybody happy? Now, yes, sir. This is not three. This is a single wick diagram of six order that has three, falls apart into three connected components. Connected, you know what connected is in the sense of tough. Yes. This is one wick diagram. This is not three wick diagrams. Okay? It corresponds to an expression d4x1, d4x6. I won't bother to write down the combinatoric factors. Psi star 1, psi 1, psi 2, psi star, whoops, 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 phi 1. Psi star 2, psi 2, phi 2, psi star 3, psi 3, uh, phi 3, ho-hum. Psi star 4, it's good for your education, though. Psi 4, phi 4, psi star, you see the advantage of writing diagrams. <laughs> Phi five, five, psi star six, psi six, phi six, normal ordered all on the outside, contract psi at one with psi star at two, contract psi at three with psi star at four, contract everything here. <laughs> so I'll have room. <laughs> Okay, that is the w single term in the Wick expansion at six order that corresponds to that particular diagram. You see it? You also see that this is a product of three terms. An x1, x2 integral, which just gives you, other than the combinatoric factors, what I would have from this diagram all by itself. An x3, x4 integral, which gives you, is the second line, and just gives you what I would get from this. And an x5, x6 integral, which just gives you what I would get from this. Okay, is that a satisfactory answer? Okay, and that's the kind of expression I have here, and now I'm taking account of the combinatoric factors. 
Now, we are now in a position to get a very simple expression for the U matrix. Because the U matrix is the sum of all diagrams, which I can just as well sum by, and here I've got an expression for a general diagram in terms of the operators attached to connected diagrams. Therefore, the final stroke and the end of the combinatoric calisthenics for the moment, ui of infinity minus infinity is the sum of all possible things of this kind. That is to say, it's the sum n1 equals 0 to infinity, the sum n2 equals 0 to infinity, dot, 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 the normal ordered product on R, O of dr over S of dr times 1 over nr factorial. Now, to the nrth power, very important. Now, we can commute the sum and the product, and, on, uh, and of course, the right-hand colon, so it's not a nonsensical equation. As usual, we can compute, commute the sum and the product and easily do the sums on each of the nrs, which simply gives us the famous theory, famous formula for the exponential. <laughs> and thus, we obtain normal order. Everything's inside the normal ordering symbol, so I don't have to worry about how the operators go. Exponential uh, sorry, uh, O of dr over S of dr. Which, by another trivial manipulation, can be normal order, exponential, sum on R, O of dr, over S of dr. I.e., this is equal to the normal ordered exponential of the sum of the connected diagrams. Now we can forget about all of our combinatorics. We have this one wonderful master theorem, which is obviously not special in any way. It's the particular theory I had in mind, I used, that the sum of all Wick diagrams, the U matrix, is in fact simply the normal ordered exponential of the sum of the connected diagrams. See, it was a long journey, but it was worth it. That's a very nice theorem to have. <laughs> Okay, this is simply the sum of all the connected diagrams arranged by pattern. Any questions? Okay, you probably have not remembered every combinatoric step, but you've kept good notes. And this is a very important theorem. It's in fact, um, well actually it's more important in statistical mechanics than it is in, uh, in our thing. You can do statistical mechanics this way. Statistical mechanics, you like to study the operator e to the minus beta h which is, after all, not that different in its algebraic structure from the operator e to the minus iht. <laughs> You're interested in computing the trace of that in perturbation theory, the trace of the trivial computation. And then you're interested in taking the logarithm of that trace to get the partition function. And this formula is the key to getting a direct perturbative expansion for the logarithm of the trace, <laughs> rather than having to first compute the trace itself out in perturbation theory and then compute its logarithm by a horrible operation. You can get a direct expansion in terms of connected diagrams only for the partition function, which of course makes this a very useful theorem in statistical mechanics. It will be useful to us, but not quite so useful. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, it depends which rule you use. Whether you put an n factorial. Here I've just summed over each pat one of each pattern because I have a symmetry number rather than an n factorial. Okay. I could sum over all diagrams and then I'd have an n factorial rather than a symmetry number. That's just two ways of writing the same sum. I will now use this formula. Solve model one. 
I've been doing everything in model three, but of course that's the most complicated case. However, model one is considered as, of course, just a special case. some space-time function that goes to zero as rapidly as we please in, some dire in all directions. Model one, of course, we could also invent diagrams. The vertices look much simpler. The primitive vertex out of which all diagrams are built is just this, <laughs> because there is only one phi field with each hi. This still means we can make a lot of diagrams. For example, I could make a diagram of 40-second order by drawing 42 of those vertices, one on top of each other. So there are an infinite set of WIC diagrams altogether, but there are only two connected WIC diagrams. This is one of them, and this is the other. <laughs> I will call this diagram A and this diagram B. Everyone agrees, if you have a pattern of vertices such that only one line can come out of any one of them, you can only draw two connected diagrams. <laughs> okay. I'll call them one and, well, one and two, I guess. Diagram one and diagram two is better. That's consistent with my previous labeling of, can, yeah, I'll make it just like my previous labeling, D1 and D2. Each of them is the only diagram of their pattern, because here the symmetry number is two, and that is to say if you exchange two and one, you get the same barbell just flipped around. <laughs> Therefore, O of D1 over 1 factorial is a minus IG from E to the minus IGH integral D4 X, and I don't even have to call it X1, there's only one of them, rho of X. 5x, and I don't even have to normal order it because there's only one field. <laughs> o of d2 over 2 factorial, I won't even bother to compute it. You'll get a homework problem on it. I'll just say it's some number which I'll define to be log a. It's obviously a number. There are no operators left. And I'll just determine that number in five minutes by self-consistency using the unitarity of the S matrix. <laughs> Therefore, by our general theorem, we have a closed form expression for ui of infinity minus infinity. It's either this, well, this is a number, so that's a, an overall normalization constant, which I will determine later, or much of it is his interest to us. I will determine later, I'll determine its magnitude. I don't care about its phase. Normal ordered, exponential, minus ig, integral d4x, rho of x, 5x. Okay. That is the expression because that is the sum of the two connected WIC diagrams, log A plus O of D1, and I say normal ordered exponential of the sum of the connected diagrams. Are there any questions? This is the complete expression for the S matrix as a term of normal order, as a sum of normal order terms. Any questions by anyone? I told you it should be an exactly soluble model. I mean, there are 42 different ways to solve it exactly. It has linear equations of motion, and anything with linear equations of motion 
is essentially an assembly of harmonic oscillators, and the assembly of harmonic oscillators can always be solved by any method you wish. Few are the methods that are so, so powerless that they do not successfully crack <laughs> an assembly of harmonic oscillators. <laughs> Any questions? <clears throat> now, let's evaluate this expression, which we have here, since after all, phi is a free field. So we know what phi is in terms of annihilation and creation operators. d4 at d cubed k, sorry, 2 pi to the 3 halves, square root of 2 omega k, a k e to the minus i k dot x, plus a k adjoint e to the plus i k dot x. That formula which I should always, which I got to get to someone to put it on a piece of cardboard so I can just point to it. Yeah. As you, uh, standardly, I define the Fourier transform of rho, rho twiddle of k equals integral d fourth x e to the i k dot x rho of x. So thus I see that minus i g integral d4 x, rho of x, phi of x, equals minus i g, integral d cubed k, 2 pi to the 3 halves, square root of 2 omega k. I will run, even though this has been a tiring lecture, ten, 5 or 10 minutes over time, because I don't want to leave with all of these formulas to be rewritten <laughs> in the next lecture. Rho of, I'll write down this part first, k and omega k, because remember up here the four components are not free. k0 equals omega k. a k adjoint plus another term, which is obviously the Hermitian conjugate. First important observation. If rho is non-zero, but its Fourier transform vanishes on the mass shell, or this particle, on the, space, on the, on the uh, four-dimensional hyperboloid, k squared equals mu squared, hyperhyperboloid, k squared equals mu squared, then nothing happens. This is simply the law of conservation of energy and momentum and the observation, diagrammatically, that this thing makes mesons one at a time. If it makes them one at a time, the amount of energy and momentum drawn out from the source must be consistent with the meson energy momentum relation. If rho of k and omega k is zero, even if it has a lot of other components that aren't zero, it's not going to be able to make a meson one at a time. Now, in order to keep write, from writing this simple expression, this complicated expression over and over again, I will simply define this as integral d cubed k f of k a k adjoint plus Hermitian conjugate, where f of k is simply minus i g rho of k and omega k over 2 pi to the 3 halves over square root of 2 omega k. Why write it forever? If f of k is non-zero, this thing can make mesons. We shake the source, and mesons fly out. It doesn't, now let's examine the uh, simplest case where we start out with the vacuum state 
<laughs> Turn on our source, wiggle it around, oscillate it, and then mesons come flying out. How do they fly out? So we've got to compute ui of infinity minus infinity on the ground state of the free field, because that's the condition the system is in by assumption. That's the experiment we wish to do. This gives us an a from an a, exponential integral d cubed k, f of k, a adjoint sub k, the whole thing acting on the vacuum state, which is not up in the exponential, of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, uh, what happened to the AKs? And what happened to the normal ordering symbol? Well, they took care of each other. Because of the normal ordering symbol, the AKs are, whenever they occur, are on the right where they meet the vacuum and they get turned into zero. So all we're left with are the terms that have pure AK adjoints in them. And since I don't have to, AK adjoints all commute with each other, I don't have to write the colon. <laughs> now, let's see what this state is and determine A by conservation uh, by probability, because it must be a state of norm 1, since it's a unitary operator acting on a state of norm 1. You recall I defined in an early lecture the n particle wave function. which is simply on our state psi, which in this case is u of infinity minus infinity vacuum. Well, let's go. We'll start writing them out one after another. Psi naught, which is just a number, because when there's naught, it's the vacuum state. Only the first term in the expansion of the exponential makes a no particle state. The second term makes a one, first term makes a one particle state, the second term makes a two particle state, etc. So psi naught is simply A. Psi one is simply A, of course times f of k. Only one k, I don't bother to call it k1, because only the first term in the expansion of the exponential makes a one particle state. Psi 2 is a again, f of k1, f of k2, because it's the second term in the exponential. What's happened to the two factorial? That's disappeared because I have two possibilities, either the first a creation operator in the integral creates k1, and the second creates k2, or vice versa. And that cancels the two factorial in the exponential. In fact, it cancels the n factorial in the nth term. f of k1 to f of kn. Are there questions? So the n particle states we make are very simple. Well, it was a very simple theory. The n particle states are simply all determined in terms of the one particle state. And the wave function for the n mesons is just the product of the n single meson wave functions. It's as close to an uncorrelated state as you can get, modulo the conditions imposed by Bose's statistics. This kind of state occurs in uh, quantum optics because of the parallelism of, of this to the optical problem, where you have some big piece of charge moving up and down. You also, the photon state turns out to be this kind of state. And therefore, peculiar optical terminology is used for this. It is called a coherent state. It is characteristic not just of uh, classical sources, but of uh, all conditions 
where the thing that is making, a, uh, making the mesons or the photons can be effectively treated as classical. For example, let me finish the remark and then I'll take, treat your question. For example, if we have a charged particle passing through matter, it's slowed down by the fact that it's ionizing atoms and it gives off a lot of photons, in extreme cases, so-called Cherenkov radiation. The very energetic photons, of course, they know that the piece of matter is not, the uh, charged particle is not just a classical source because they give it a gigantic recoil whenever it emits one of those very energetic photons. But if it emits only not so energetic photons, uh, what we call soft photons, from their viewpoint, the piece of matter is, where is enormously heavy and is essentially a classical object that does not recoil. So the soft part of the photon spectrum emitted in the passage of a charged particle through matter or the slowing of a charged particle, bending of a charged particle in a magnetic field obeys this pattern. It is a coherent state pattern. Whenever you can treat the thing that is emitting the mesons or the photons or whatever as a classical state and factorial times. The state K1, K2 is the same as the state K2, K1. This is an easy integral to do. It's absolute value of A squared over N factorial integral d to k f squared to the nth power. I will call this number just so I don't have to keep writing it again a to the nth a squared over n factorial alpha to the nth where alpha is defined as that number. <clears throat> it is now fairly easy to sum up P of n. And of course, the sum of P of n over all n must be 1. That is the conservation of probability. And thus, we'll determine a squared. We'll determine the magnitude of a. Its phase will not be of interest to us. a squared e to the alpha equals 1, which implies that a squared equals e to the minus alpha. That was the consistency computation. And thus, p of n, the probability of finding n particles in the final state, is e to the minus alpha, alpha to the n, over n factorial the famous Poisson distribution. <laughs> Thus we find in this radiation process the uh, probability of finding n mesons, as a uh, high energy physicist would say, the multiplicity distribution in this production process is a Poisson distribution. <laughs> What is the average number of mesons produced? Also an interesting question. Are we, as we say, the mean multiplicity? If you do the experiment a billion times, what is the average number of mesons made each time? Is, of course, the sum on n, p of n, equals sum on n, e to the minus alpha, n equals 0 to infinity, e to the alpha to the nth over n factorial times n, or it can also be written as e to the minus alpha, alpha sum n minus 1 equals 0 to infinity, since the zeroth term doesn't contribute anything, um, alpha to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial which is obviously alpha. <laughs> well, that's just standard fun and games with the Poisson distribution. <laughs> <laughs> so this quantity alpha, the integral d cubed k, absolute value of f squared, which measures the mean number of mesons produced, 
uh, is, in fact, the, is in fact the mean multiplicity. In next lecture, I will do a bit more on this model. I will find out what the average energy produced is in terms of rho and momentum. And then I will go on to model number two, which, of course, also exactly soluble.